Hello, this is Levi Wumper with MMAStrikingCoach.com. Today we're going to be speaking with Samuel Sheridan. He's the author of Fighter's Mind and Fighter's Heart. How are you doing today, Sam? I'm doing great, Levi. Thanks for having me. Oh, no problem, no problem. Could you let us know a little bit about how you got started in martial arts? Well, you know, like I think like probably you know a lot of people who got into MMA, I started pretty young in, uh, in karate and traditional arts with a guy um, named Richard Roy in uh, Massachusetts who was a sort of a, you know, did a lot of different things. He did uh, Arnis and karate and a few other things. Um, but I didn't, you know, do too much of it. And then I, you know, I played sports all through high school, but I got into boxing in college, which really, you know, was where I caught the bug. It's really where I kind of got into martial arts was in boxing because of the, you know, full contact headgear and excitement of it. You know, it was really, it was really fun. It really sort of changed my world, boxing did. That's great. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about, uh, or tell us about how you got the idea for your first book? Well, you know, I had um, it sort of evolved. You know, I sort of the the I I, I was, had been sailing for for about a couple of years, and I I was pretty sick of sailing. I was young. I was about twenty five, and I had boxed in college, but I'd never really explored it as far as I wanted to go. And I got off the boat in Australia, and I you know picked up a, a kickboxer magazine. Um, and there was an ad for a camp in Thailand, which this is about 99 or so. And I, I, you know, sort of started emailing this camp. This is the early days of email. And eventually I went over and lived in Thailand and fought there, um, as I detailed in my first book. But I never really thought it was going to be, you know, uh, such a, a life-changing event. I, You know, I loved it. I had a great time. I enjoyed the fight. Um, I loved training. But I never thought about being a writer. It wasn't until later um, when I was, I had worked did a couple different jobs and I was working as a firefighter in uh, in the uh, in New Mexico. I was working as a hotshot. Uh, a friend of mine put me on to an agent um, who had sort of heard this story. You know, the story, my, my story in Thailand was kind of a cool story. I ended up fighting this guy who was, uh, you know, like an ex Yakuza. Uh, it was a black belt in full contact karate and, and I ended up you know, beating him because he wasn't in shape. But there was a lot of drama in the story. And um, we, you know, we sort of tossed around a version of that for a couple of months. And eventually he sold it to a men's magazine, the Men's Journal. And from there, Men's Journal, uh, you know, was interested in more articles. And eventually they were interested in a book. And uh, we ended up selling the book to somebody else to the long and sort of tawdry tale of publishing. But that's kind of how the book came about, it sort of evolved out of uh, just sort of, you know, natural choices. Yeah. That's great. Just kind of fell into it, just mm-hmm. didn't set out for it. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about what it was like to train and compete in Thailand? You know, it's, it's, Thailand's great. It's very relaxing. It's, it's changed a lot, uh, of course. Um, I think, and I sort of detail this in my first book, the difference between going in 99, 2000, and going in 2004 was uh, Fairtex, and I think some of the other camps as well. Up until that point, a lot of these camps, you know, their primary focus was was um, you know in country professional Thai boxers, and mm-hmm. I think what changed was they really realized this martial arts tourism that 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 foreigners coming and training would uh, was a way for them to make sort of more money and, and, and in particular Fairtex changed dramatically you know I had the first time I was there I slept on the floor um, you know in a, in a dingy room with three other guys and, and it was very rough you know and, and when I went back there was you know a full sort of spa facility there and, and you know wow. in-house massage and a pool and, and, and they had really sort of set up this program to cater to foreigners and, and I think when you go to Muay Thai in Thailand you know, you often see <clears throat> way more foreigners in the in the ringside seats than than Thai, and that's and sort of foreign interest is is uh is what keeps Muay Thai really really uh going in Thailand. I mean, I'm not this is not uh, definitive, but that's just sort of anecdotal evidence. I mean, I think betting is what used to draw drive um, Muay Thai uh, mm-hmm. gambling. And a lot of that gambling has switched to uh, English Premier League soccer, which was hugely popular when I went back in, in 04, 05, 06. I'm not sure if it still is, but, you know, every region of Thailand had its own, you know, English Premier League soccer team they followed, and that was what was everybody was betting on. 
So <clears throat> certainly foreign interest, you know, there's a ton of tourism that's just just to do Muay Thai, which was not the case when I went originally. It was still it was being done but nowhere near to the extent uh, as when I went back. Mm-hmm. But it's it's great. I mean, training in Thailand's wonderful. It's it's extremely restful, you know, it's a beautiful country. The people are great. The food is good. The training is top notch. And you don't have to worry about anything. You live in a camp and there's no driving and there's no you know, all you do is is train and sleep and eat. It's very very relaxing in that sense. <laughs> Sounds awesome. I'm going to get over there soon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, you also spent some time in your first book, you talk about training uh, MMA with Pat Militich. I've heard it can be kind of a rough plus place to train. Could you tell us a little bit about that experience? Yeah, no, certainly Pat's place was famous for being a rough place. I mean, all those sort of older school MMA places, and today, of course, I mean, most MMA places are pretty rough, but Pat in particular did, uh, you know, two nights a week of hard sparring, um, Mondays and Wednesdays. Uh, and it was pretty brutal. You'd see, you know, a couple guys get knocked out, and and a lot of guys get smashed, and I get my nose broken a couple times, and and you know, you just, it was a rough, a rough sort of baptism, and you know, it has its place. I think, um, you know, if you haven't been exposed to that, it's good for you to get toughened up. And a lot of guys, you know, if you go through some wars like that in the gym, you you by the time you get to a fight, it's not as bad. I think in the long term, it's probably not as good uh you know you don't really need to get pounded on um that much and uh and it makes you um a little timid you know if you're if you're just in survival mode you're not trying out new things you know if you're if you're getting dropped every time you make a mistake you're going to turtle up and and be very cautious in what you do and so there's just pros and cons i think um i think more recently mma camps have gotten a little savvier about their uh they're super hard sparring days, you know, they're, what are they, some people call them red flag days or whatever, you know, they have different terms for them, but, you know, I think um, Sean Tompkins, before he passed, was, was was talking about once a month, which probably is better, and, and you look at what professional boxers do, they sort of, they set up rounds, so, you know, even, even for, you know, high-level pros, they're only going to spar 30, 40, 50 rounds uh, of hard sparring to get ready for a fight over... You know, six, eight weeks, a month, you know, seven, a couple of months, whatever they're going to do. Mm-hmm. Um, so the kind of consistent pounding, I think, you know, is a little bit out of out of favor right now. And 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 certainly, um, you know, the Militich gym is is not what it used to be. I mean, I love Pat and and all that and and all his guys, but they've sort of uh, they've sort of spread out to the to the to the winds these days. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, you're not gonna go very long in the sport training hard like that all the time no i think you know it's again it's great to begin with because you need to get you need to be tough and you need to get toughened up and you need to be exposed to that intensity but i do think um pretty quickly you need to not get smashed like that i mean you know (laughs) i hate to get into it but all the uh all the recent evidence from all the nfl studies you know your brain fits pretty perfectly in your skull and and any kind of you know knocking it around is uh, you're, you're tearing up that lining and, and causing little tiny micro concussions and all that stuff is you know it's not good for your long term uh, health and career. Oh yeah. Now, uh, through your travel, you trained with some very high level boxing, kickboxing, and MMA schools coaches. Uh, what would you say is probably the best way to practice striking specifically for mixed martial arts? You know, I think <clears throat> sort of what we're talking about, uh, I do think you need to put on headgear and a mouth guard and, and 15-ounce gloves and, and bang occasionally. Mm-hmm. But I think more often uh, you need to spar much lighter and positionally with MMA gloves, uh, you know, which which with takedowns, with the real, you know, with the real rules. Because, you know, with 15 ounces, you're not really doing takedowns the same way and stuff. I mean, you can yeah. do it. but And Pat did it, on, did it on Mondays. But it's not quite the same. And I think the danger of too much sparring, you know, you'll see it with guys, is they get comfortable in the pocket and they think they can take one. And you can't, you can't take one to give one in MMA. I mean, we've all seen flash knockdowns from the tiniest grazing punch with a four-inch four ounce uh gloves. Oh, yeah. And you just can't you can't stand and trade. It's not a 
you know, standing in that 50%, we're both equal, we're going to throw until one of us goes down. It's just, it's not something that smart fighters do. You know, George St. Pierre never, he, he got caught by Matt Serra, and he's never gotten sucked into a firefight since. You know, he's taken everybody down, he'll beat them up there. So I think, <clears throat> you know, for MMA training, you definitely want to do a little bit with boxing gloves, but I think if you do too much, you end up, uh, you know, burning in, drills and and and, um, and things you're comfortable with that are actually going to be uh, uh, bad for you in a fight. Mm-hmm. No, that's a good point. you got to tr- uh, play like you practice, and if you're wearing the big gloves all the time, you're going to make mistakes. I mean, I, I know from my own experience, when I was boxing a ton, I felt really comfortable with my defense, and then I put on MMA gloves, and guys would hit me through my defense all the time because they can sneak in, you know, you, 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 you cover up like you're answering the phone, and I can still sneak right through there and catch you on the jaw with a four ounce glove. I mean, that's separate from the fact that a four ounce glove can can cause a flash knockdown much much easier than a, a fifteen ounce glove. I mean, it's just that's a whole different 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 argument. I mean, your defense is totally different. I think we you know what I saw. Um, you know, guys like Kenny Florian do was much more sparring with four ounce gloves. And and it was much more wrestling and a lot more distance utilization and and you know it's more like an MMA fight um, and I think you know in the long run that's what you're doing and that's what you got to practice you know, as you say. Mm-hmm. That's good. Uh, when you were traveling, you did this a few years back, but uh, did you run into many foreigners while you were traveling? I mean, uh, I guess Americans or English speakers, foreigners to those countries. And, uh, yeah, you know, there were definitely some. I mean, certainly the first time I went to Thailand, there weren't many. Uh, mm-hmm. There was only about two or three guys at the camp. And sometimes there were no guys at the camp of, you know, 50, 60 guys at Fairtex and Bank. And now I'm sure there's probably 15 or 20 foreigners there all the time, if not more. And, and big groups come through, you know, from Australia. You know, a big group of 15 or 20 guys from a single Muay Thai club will come through. Wow. Uh, in Rio, there were a couple guys. There are always a couple guys down there doing jujitsu. I'm sure there's there's times and places where there's more and less. And and uh, you know, even in the '80s, I know there were guys going from to Thailand from Australia. And you know, Rob Common was living in Thailand. And, and so, I mean, there's always been a few guys doing it. I think with MMA and the kind of you know whatever you want to call it, the tough explosion, or you know, since. 04, 05, that kind of, you know, the growth we've seen in, in, in MMA has certainly translated to a lot more people. I know there's, you know, hundreds of gyms in Thailand that take foreigners. Well, when I was there in 99, there was two. There were Sityatong and Fairtex were the only two places that foreigners could train. You know, so that's, and now there's there's places in Pattaya, there's places in, you know, Phuket. They're everywhere on all the islands. I mean, it's it's really a huge industry. Uh so that's that's definitely been a major change. Mm-hmm. Uh, meeting these people and doing your travels, what do you think are mistakes that people make when they do travel? Like if we were, uh, if I was going to travel, what would you tell me? You know, some advice you would give me for it? You know, certainly in Thailand um, and in Brazil, you know, you see people that just they just they're they have a short time and they try to do too much. You know, they try mm-hmm. to train too hard and they get hurt, they get sick, um, and they don't end up getting much out of their time. I think. The very best thing you can possibly do if you're going to Thailand or Brazil is to give yourself a couple of months to train uh, and give yourself, you know, a couple of weeks to get in a groove uh, because it's just so easy to get hurt and so easy to get sick and there's infections and you're not, you know, there's, you're not sleeping well. There's time changes. The food's different. The heat, uh, you know, it's easy to get. You know, we all know from training at home. It's pretty easy to get wiped out um, mm-hmm. physically, and and you gotta you know you gotta sort of protect yourself a little bit if you want to get the most out of your your trip. And the other thing I would say is you know take care of your local coaches. You know like uh, find ways to to tip guys that they are taking that are training you. I mean the, you sort of you have to kind of cut through the the manager sometimes of these camps and go right to your the trainers you want to work with or that you think are the best for your style, or that you think know the most, and, and you know, basically bribe them with gifts or, or you know, or something. Take them shopping, buy them a bottle of whiskey, whatever, you know, and sort of try and, you know, you're there to learn something. Try and uh, 
try and get somebody to invest in you a little bit because it's very easy for these guys, you know, in Thailand or, or anywhere that they see, you know, so many foreigners come through. It's sort of, you know, they're going to kind of phone it in and just teach you what they teach everybody, you know, and if you mm-hmm. want to kind of uh, um, get a little more specific training, get a little more out of your experience, you sort of have to be proactive. Mm-hmm. That's good. So just, uh, just like here, you know, you need to be your coach's friend. Yeah. You, know, um, yeah. you need to make your coaches invest in you. I mean, in anywhere. It's, it's, particularly if you've if you're got anybody who's going pro. I mean, if you don't have a coach invest in you, you need to find one if you're going mm-hmm. pro. You know, that's all. Wow. Good. Uh, could you share with us your favorite training materials, equipment, or resources? Just anything you think all fighters should have or know about? You know, I don't really have anything like equipment or, you know, it's sort of, all I would say is, you know, if you're going somewhere to travel, live as close to the gym as possible. That's all. You know, live, if you can live above the gym or a block from the gym, great. You know, just do that. Cool. Because otherwise it just becomes too much of a hassle if it's, you know, a bus and a train and this and that. You know, it just, it becomes something you won't end up doing enough. So if you're going to travel or move someplace, you need to just live in the gym, literally. Yeah, you know, if you're going there to train, find some place that you can walk to the gym. <laughs> uh, what is the best advice your mentors ever gave you about anything? Just advice you think everybody should know. Oh, man. <laughs> I'm trying to think. There's been, you know, everybody's given me great advice. I wrote a whole book on the fighter's mind. It's all just, you know, it's all... <laughs> Great mental advice from all kinds of coaches and, and Dan Gable and, and uh, you know, Randy Couture and, and all these guys. Um, you know, I have no idea. I actually don't have anything that's like, you know, a single piece of advice. You know, I think there's interesting stories. You know, Randy Couture would always talk about having positive sort of things to say. Instead of, you know, instead of screaming at a guy, don't get taken down, you know, screaming at him, get the underhook, you know, like give him something to do that's positive as opposed to trying to avoid a negative. And you put this idea now of getting taken down in his head and he gets taken down. So I think, you know, and that's kind of like a life coach thing. I think, you know, the more active you stay and the more proactive uh, you think about your problems, you know, don't, don't wait, I guess. Don't wait mm-hmm. would be my advice to anybody. I mean, I'm out in Hollywood now, you know, and I see a lot of uh, people waiting around for their break, and it's like that's never going to happen. You have to make make things happen. And, and I, w- I just went elk hunting, um, and uh, elk hunting is not like you know hunting whitetails. It's very much proactive. You have to go and make it happen. You know, you sort of you have to stalk the elk, and uh, because they move so much, you have to go make it happen. So I guess. You know, that's kind of the advice I would. I've, it's been the best for me. Is you know, if you want something, you sort of have to, uh, you know, come up with a strategy and then very proactively make it happen. That's pretty good advice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, this is uh, been Levi Wampler with MMA Striking Coach. We've been speaking with Samuel Sheridan of A Fighter's Mind and A Fighter's Heart. Uh, thank you for speaking with us today. It's my pleasure, Levi.